Welcome back to the Fitness Blueprint Podcast. My name is Jackson Adamwitz, and today we will be talking about the wonderful world of resistance training. We're going to cover things like what exactly resistance training entails. We're going to talk about the numerous benefits that come with regular resistance training. We'll talk about some of the common barriers that people face when starting resistance training, strategies for overcoming those barriers. We'll talk about building your first strength training or resistance training program like a personal trainer would. And then interspersed with that, we'll talk about some of the common principles and rules to sort of follow and pay attention to as you're building out your program and making significant progress in your resistance training and exercise journey. So before we get into the nitty gritty of things, I want to first outline what exactly resistance training is. Uh, Simply put, A simple definition is resistance training is a form of periodic exercise where external weights or resistance provide a progressive overload to muscles in order to make them stronger and often result in hypertrophy or muscle growth. So that is a very wordy definition, but basically it means you're either using some sort of external resistance in an effort to get stronger, improve coordination, or build lean muscle mass. Now let's talk about the numerous benefits that come with regular resistance training, and I don't think this will be an all-inclusive list because there are just so many benefits and I could probably go on for hours and hours, similar to how I could go on and on for the numerous benefits of cardio in our previous episode. But we'll start with one of the benefits that I think is often overlooked in resistance excuse me, resistance training, which is that resistance training is actually good for cardiovascular health. Now, this is most commonly seen in more untrained individuals or people just starting out, but there have been studies that show that regular resistance training can reduce blood pressure in a comparative measure to aerobic exercise or cardio. Additionally, there have been studies to show that uh, resistance training can lower LDL cholesterol, which is considered bad cholesterol, by numerous health practices, and it can increase HDL cholesterol, which is known as the good cholesterol in many health practices. So resistance training, good for cardiovascular health. I don't think a lot of people really realize just how important resistance training is for your heart and for your body in general. The next one, which is might be a no-brainer for some, but that is that resistance training is good for your body composition and your body's health. One of the obvious benefits of regular resistance training is improving muscle mass or increasing muscle size, also known as increasing lean body mass. Additionally, some of the benefits that you can receive are decreasing fat mass. Now, those two aren't necessarily directly connected, uh, but it's just good for body composition in general. Additionally, your muscles are one of the largest sites in your body of postprandial glucose disposal, basically meaning after you eat, the sugars from your meal have to go somewhere, and usually they're stored as glycogen within your muscles. So the more muscle mass you have, the more lean body mass you have, uh, the more disposal, or I guess the more storage that you will have for that glucose. Um, So this can be very beneficial for diabetics, which is our next benefit. Resistance training helps in the prevention and the reduction of severity in type 2 diabetes. Um, So as I mentioned before, with that postprandial glucose storage, that can be a benefit. Additionally, uh, there have been signs of improvements in glucose and insulin homeostasis. Um, So resistance training will positively affect that insulin sensitivity within the body. Additionally, it has been shown to control blood sugar values. So this is very good for people who are type 2 diabetics or who might be considered pre-diabetic or really just anybody who's trying to prevent uh, type 2 diabetes. The next benefit that we will dive into is related to arthritis. So a lot of people think, you know, uh, arthritic changes occur with old age and with old age it might be more dangerous to resistance train or do a lot of more vigorous exercise that might not necessarily be the case for most people so there have been studies that show that in osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis that resistance training can actually be very beneficial in maintaining and even improving the function of whatever arthritic joint and whatever kind of body region that might be affected. In individuals with arthritis um, who resistance strain, it has been shown that they can increase their strength in their hypertrophy or that muscle gain, especially surrounding those affected joints. 
Additionally, some studies suggest that it can reverse the cachexia effects. Um, cachexia is just kind of a fancy word for unexplained muscle wasting, if you're not familiar. And um, as I mentioned, it's good for both osteoarthritis and rheumatoid arthritis. Now, if you have either of these conditions, I would recommend reaching out to a medical or fitness professional about ways that you can manage this, but resistance training can be beneficial. One of the next benefits this one I think is very important because as a physical therapy student, I see this all the time, uh, but the prevention of osteoporosis and osteopenia. So kind of declination of uh, the bone quality in your body. So how does resistance training do this? Well, whenever we load the body with resistance or with weights, this has been shown to increase bone mineral density. Additionally, the bone will actually remodel uh, depending on the types of mu muscle contractions that it undergoes. So the muscles attached to the bones, if you're not familiar, um, and when that muscle contracts, it kind of pulls on that bone. And so the bone will then remodel and rebuild uh, to accompany that pull or that resistance uh, that is given. So resistance training, incredibly important at maintaining good bone quality, especially as we age. So one of the last benefits that we'll cover, but this list, as I mentioned, is not entirely extensive, is the improvement in mental health. So when you regularly resistance train, it's been shown to improve cognition, improve self-esteem, improve quality of life in general, decrease depression, and decrease anxiety. So there are many health benefits associated with regular resistance training. So you're probably wondering, well, why haven't I started? Or why is it so hard for people to get started? And we're gonna kind of dive into that in our next section here with the common barriers of starting regular res resistance training programs. So some of those common barriers include, but are not limited to, not being sure where to really get started, not really sure how to exercise properly or use proper exercise form while resistance training, being intimidated at the gym, not really sure where to start, maybe a little uncomfortable around other people working out, having a lack of equipment access, and then also a fear of sustaining an injury while resistance training. If any of those barriers sound familiar to you or maybe one of the reasons why you haven't started resistance training, uh, we will be sure to address all of those common barriers within the episode. Before we do all of that, I want to talk about some of the mental hurdles, and this will touch on a few of those barriers uh, that we mentioned previously. One of the biggest barriers that I see, especially in more gym-related working out settings is gym intimidation or gym intimidation which is that intimidating feeling of going into the gym either not being sure what to do or kind of being a little uncomfortable because you might be worried that other people are judging you you might be worried for a lot of different reasons but gym intimidation is a very real thing and some of the most common sources for that gym intimidation are like i said that feeling that you don't belong maybe uncertainty of how or why you're doing what you're doing in the gym, and then also social comparison or that fear of judgment. So I want to propose a few different strategies that can kind of touch on all of those common causes for gym intimidation and hopefully make you a little bit more comfortable and at ease with approaching a gym or a higher intensity workout setting. So let's first start with the feeling like you don't belong in that gym space. So simply put, the more that you show up and the more that you learn about fitness and the goals that you are seeking to achieve, the more comfortable you will be in that setting. So it's very similar with like, let's say you start a new job. Well, your first day, you might not necessarily be 100% comfortable, especially if you're using new skills that you are just now learning on the job or if you're interacting with people in a way that you've never interacted with before, it's gonna feel uncomfortable. But as you go through your training, as you start practicing, as you start actually working in that role, you tend to get a lot more comfortable. And the same goes for any type of exercise, any type of interaction in the gym. The more you do it, the more you show up, the more comfortable you're going to be. And I know that's easier said than done, so I, I have a few other suggestions, if you will, uh, with how to overcome this feeling like you don't belong. So the first one, as I mentioned, show up regularly. Consistency is key. Um, the second one, and this is one that I also touched on a little bit, but educate yourself. So 
If you're listening to this podcast and you are a beginner in your fitness journey, you're in the right place. My goal here is to make you as comfortable as possible with beginning your exercise journey and also just being comfortable with what you know so that you can apply it to achieve your goals. And then last but not least, set realistic goals. Uh, Define your fitness goals clearly and create a plan to achieve them. So not having a plan to achieve your goals might make you feel a little bit more uncomfortable than somebody who would have a plan for achieving those goals. So I've heard it a lot from people that I do online personal training with, but just having that plan to follow and just knowing that, okay, if I follow this plan, if I stay consistent with it, I'll start to see the results that I want to see. That can be really reassuring for people and can also make them feel like what they're doing in the gym is actually meaningful. So have a plan and stick with it. Next, being uncertain about what you're doing in the gym, either what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you're doing it. That's all going to be kind of combined into one bucket here. My first piece of advice is do your research, uh, but don't take forever. So understand the basic concepts of whatever you're trying to achieve and understand the basic principles. That's what we're here to do in this podcast, and hopefully you'll have other resources as well that can help you along the way. So understand the basics, but do not be paralyzed with the idea that you have to know every single thing about the gym in order to start working out. That's simply not true, and the best way to learn, as with anything else, is to just start getting after it once you understand the basics and the the foundations behind what you're trying to do. So do not succumb to paralysis by analysis. Don't hold yourself back. Start simple. So start with simple exercises that you're comfortable with or that you feel would be easy for you to progress. Then gradually kind of build up as you become more comfortable and more confident. That's kind of a good general approach. Next, and if you're still feeling kind of unsure after your own research, seek guidance. Either find a friend or family member who does exercise regularly and kind of shadow them a little bit. Maybe ask them to join them at the gym or ask them to kind of teach you what they are doing and why they're doing it. Uh, One of the best ways to learn is through people that we really care about. Additionally, if you are able to, you can consider hiring a personal trainer or reaching out to a fitness specialist um, in whatever realm of goal that you're trying to achieve. So anybody who has accredited certifications is going to be a fairly reliable source. So seek guidance if you really need it and if you're able to. And then last, I think this is probably one of the most common reasons that people get intimidated in the gym is kind of that social comparison or that fear of judgment. So at most gyms, unless you go to kind of like a specialty gym, there will be people of all different fitness levels there. So you'll have beginners, you'll have intermediate level individuals, and then you'll have the advanced individuals who are usually the ones who tend to intimidate, usually unintentionally, the beginners. So you're going to kind of have that wide mix of people. No matter what their goal is at the gym, everyone typically shares a common objective, which is self-improvement. And I think that's the beautiful thing about working out. And I think that's the beautiful thing about going to the gym is that everybody kind of has this combined mission of improving themselves, improving their health, improving their well-being, improving their confidence, whatever it is. Everybody's trying to improve. And I think that that is absolutely beautiful. My piece of advice for maybe you're feeling like you're comparing yourself to other individuals, maybe more advanced, maybe individuals on your level who you might think are progressing quicker than you, whatever it may be, whatever type of comparison you're drawing or whatever type of fear of judgment you may be having, I would encourage you to focus inward on yourself because as I mentioned, everybody's common objective is self-improvement and that's an amazing thing that I think we should all embrace. If you're just beginning, remember that everybody starts somewhere. A big jacked bodybuilder pumping 100 pound curls in the corner started as a beginner. The guy who runs four marathons a week and is just super lightning fast on the treadmill used to be a beginner. So everybody has to start somewhere and if you are just starting out, realize that. When you focus on your own progress and improvement, rather than comparing yourself to others, your mission becomes more important, right? It's more important to you because you're benefiting yourself. So focus inwards on yourself, on whatever goal you're trying to achieve, 
why you're trying to achieve it, and you will see a lot more success. My next piece of advice would be find a supportive environment. So as I mentioned earlier, find a friend, find a family member who already goes to the gym. Try and go with them. Maybe you join a fitness class that's designated for beginners. There are a lot of options out there in the fitness community for beginners because we all want to see each other succeed. We all want to see each other get better, okay? Next, and this one takes a little bit of practice, but work on shifting your perspective, okay? So instead of viewing other people as competitors, see them as potential sources of inspiration and motivation. So that bodybuilder that I mentioned earlier who's curling 100 pounds in the corner, Use that as inspiration if your goal is to get really, really strong or to get really, really buff, build a lot of muscle. If that's not your goal, that's okay. But use those individuals, pay attention to their work ethic, pay attention to what they're focusing on, and use, I guess, pick and choose the information that you want and use it as motivation. Use that as inspiration for your journey. Lastly, I just wanna say this, I wanna address this, but most people at the gym are focused on their own workouts they're focused on that self-improvement aspect and we tend to get this spotlight effect where we think that everybody's paying attention to us you know we're kind of hyper focused on what we're doing especially if we're new to something uh, and we think that everybody's eyes are on us and we're worried about what other people think I ensure you that 99% of the people at the gym are not paying attention to you okay you are going to be your biggest critic you are going to be your worst enemy when it comes to your mindset, especially if you are afraid of people judging you. Okay, so focus inwards on yourself. Understand that we have this spotlight-like effect in our own brain, and understand that the people in the gym are there for themselves. They're there for that self-improvement aspect. Okay, so I hope that that's reassuring. Again, your fear is not invalidated. Okay, it's very valid to be uncomfortable in a new environment or a environment where there's just a lot going on, right? It's usually a very high stimulating environment. Okay, that's okay. Just embrace your own personal journey, take it in stride and get after it. Now that we've addressed some of the common mental barriers that we face, let's talk about building your first strength training or resistance training program. Okay, there are a lot of different modalities for resistance training. So as I mentioned, it's anything with some sort of external resistance. That can be barbells, that can be machines, that can even just be your own body weight against gravity. Okay, that's the amazing thing that you can get a workout in just about anywhere with pretty minimal equipment if you know how to take the right steps. So let's take a quick dive into all the different types of modalities. And again, it's gonna be very hard to make an entirely extensive list on this topic because there are so many possible ways you can incorporate resistance training into your routine. First of all, you can use your own body weight against gravity. So you can do air squats, push-ups, sit-ups, things of that nature. That's a form of resistance training. You can do machine-based exercises. If you've ever been to a gym or seen pictures of a gym, you'll see all the machines kind of scattered about. And there are kind of two primary kinds of machines. There are plate-loaded machines. This is where you take the actual physical weights and stack them onto uh, different pegs on the side of whatever machine you're working on. And then there are pin-loaded machines where you kind of pull out that pin, move it up or down on a weight stack, and then that'll be the resistance that you have. So machine-based exercises. Then you have usually have a pulley or cable system. This is like a detachable pulley where you kind of pull out the pin, adjust the height of it. You can attach different attachments to it, different handles, that kind of thing for whatever exercise that you're trying to do. You have resistance bands, which come in a lot of different forms. You can get ones with handles on it. You can get TheraBands, you can get mini bands. Any type of resistive or elastic resistance is an option. You have suspension training. I know that sounds a little fancy, but pretty much that's something that's suspended from usually the roof or a wall. Uh, make sure, first of all, that it's stable, whatever it's attached to, um, and you can use your body weight on, and you can use your body weight against gravity with those as well. So this, these are things like TRX bands, if you've ever seen them. Usually they have handles. You can uh, attach your hands or your feet or whatever you want to it, depending on whatever exercise. Then we have free weights. So 
one of the more considered classic modes of resistance training. So these are your your dumbbells, your barbells, uh, anything that's essentially that's not attached to some sort of machine is considered a free weight. Okay, so these require a little bit more practice, a little bit more proper body mechanics for uh, you know, ensuring your safety, but that's also an option. With all of these options, do not get overwhelmed. So when you first walk into the gym, you're gonna be like, oh my gosh, you know, what do I start with? What do I do? And again, that that kind of comes with the idea that if you have a plan, you'll be a lot more prepared. You'll know exactly what to do, that kind of thing. But also, once you start to get more acclimated, adjusted to that gym setting, you'll start to become more aware of where things are, what certain things do, how certain pieces of machinery, certain pieces of equipment can be used, how it can be structured within your workout depending on the space that you have. So there are a lot of things that just come naturally with time and consistency. So that first initial step into a gym feeling, that's not always going to be your feeling, okay? Even for an advanced lifter, when they first step into a new gym that they are just not really sure the layout of, there's a little twinge of anxiety. It's like, whoa, like there's a lot here. Where do I get started kind of thing? So do not get overwhelmed with all of the different modalities. Just understand that there are plenty of options out there for you. With all of these options, you're probably wondering, where do I get started? So I personally, as a personal trainer, for somebody who has never done any type of resistance training, I recommend first starting with more body weight based movements and machine based movements so that you can get the form down properly for whatever you're trying to accomplish. I recommend practicing body weight movements to perfect general body mechanics. I recommend machine-based movements for the initial loading phases just so your muscles can get used to that external load of resistance in kind of a single plane of motion depending on the machine. Usually machines are, are pretty safe just because they're kind of locked into the position that you move it in so it's not you know gonna go all haywire on you go all over the place. Um, Additionally, a lot of machines have pictures or even different QR codes that you can scan with a video demonstration of whatever exercise that is intended uh, that you do or perform on the machine. So I, I really like machines and body weight when you're first getting started. Then as you get more comfortable with those movements, you can consider progressing to more free weight or kind of open style of movements. Um, when you first get started with free weights, I recommend practicing proper form with a lighter set of weights than what you think you might be capable of, just so you get the form down, you feel comfortable with it, and then progress as you start to get more acclimated to using that free weight and kind of understanding how your body moves in space with that external load that is not pinned down to whatever machine or whatever cable, whatever it may be. And then again, as you start to get more advanced, it can be kind of fun trying out a new piece of equipment that maybe you've never tried before. So just consider kind of gradually progressing along as you get more comfortable. Next, I think it is important to understand the basic principles of resistance training. No matter why you are performing resistance training, whether it's building muscle, building strength, obtaining health benefits, improving functionality, or all of those, there are some key principles that you should stick to. The number one principle that you will hear if you read a lot of fitness literature, a lot of fitness sources, you might hear these buzzwords, but progressive overload. So this is the idea that we need to overload the body's system over time to create and sustain adaptions that we can make from strength training. How do we accomplish this? How do we achieve progressive overload? This is accomplished by gradually or progressively pushing yourself more and more over time, right? So let's say I start with a simple bicep curl exercise with 10 pounds, okay? Let's say I can do that for eight reps. Well, let's say it's starting to get pretty easy after a while. Well, in order to progressively overload, you'd wanna to continue to challenge yourself. You can do that by increasing the number of reps that you do, increasing the number of sets, increasing the weight that you do. You've got a lot of options in terms of progressive overload. So you just kind of want to gradually keep pushing yourself so that your body can continue to adapt to the stresses that you put on it. In terms of the level of challenge, you want to be able to challenge yourself, but you want it to be doable. I like to say just go outside of you. I like to say just go 
I like to say go just outside the edge of your comfort zone. Over time, your body will adapt. You'll eventually, over time, your body will adapt. You'll notice that you're able to do more and more than you were previously, and that's where tracking your workouts comes into play. You want to make sure that you're kind of keeping tabs on what weights you do for certain exercises, so that way, the next workout you come back and you say, oh, I don't remember what I did for the shoulder press exercise, well, you can look back and see just exactly what you did. And there's numerous ways you can track your workouts. There's apps out there. You can simply just write it down, use your notes app in your phone, whatever you want to do, just kind of pay attention to that principle of progressive overload and then gradually progress over time. Now with progressive overload, you never want to make a super massive jump in resistance, no matter what exercise you're doing. So test the waters first, especially if it's uncharted territory. If you are not sure what you do for a certain lift, it would be a good idea not to put the pin down on the heaviest weight possible on the machine, right? Try it at an easier weight, gradually progress your way up as you start to feel more comfortable, and don't make super massive jumps. As a general rule of thumb for upper body exercises, try increasing load maybe five to 10 pounds. Um, and for lower body exercises, you can kind of be a little bit more progressive with it. You could maybe aim for 10 to 20 pounds, but again, that's dependent on the exercise. In general, just gradually work your way up. Okay, don't make super large jumps because that is how you can get injured. How often should you work out? As another general rule of thumb, you will want to aim to hit every major muscle group at least two times per week. You should rest anywhere from 48 to 72 hours between working those major muscle groups. Uh, for more advanced individuals, that rest time might be a little bit less, but for somebody first starting out, you might feel a little bit sore after the workout. That's okay, that is totally natural. We'll talk about that here in a second. What the heck is a workout split and why is it important? A workout split is the way you break up your workouts to ensure that you're getting those two major muscle groups worked out every week. Um, so for example, we've got a lot of muscles in our body, okay? To make sure that we're hitting all the major muscle groups, let's say you do a upper body and lower body split, which what that means is you will do one workout upper body, you'll do one workout lower body focused. And then later in the week, after an adequate rest period, you would want to do one workout upper body and then another workout lower body so that you're getting those major muscle groups involved. Additionally, you might have heard of the push-pull method to a training split. This is just kind of separating the exercises between a pushing movement and a pulling movement on different days. And again, you would want to make sure you're hitting every major muscle group at least two times per week. You might have heard of working individual muscle groups. So I want to work my biceps today. I want to work my triceps. I want to work my quadriceps. That you might have also heard of it called the bro split. Um, but that is just kind of the idea that you're breaking up every workout to just isolate one single muscle group. As a beginner, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that. And then you have full body days where you're just kind of working all the major muscle groups with more compound movements. Uh, compound is just a fancy way of saying multi-joint movements. Um, so there are a lot of ways that you can split up the workouts so that you're getting two times per week on every major muscle group. Now let's talk about delayed onset muscle soreness, also known as DOMS. So this is where, let's say you have a really hard workout, or maybe it's just your first workout and you're not used to resistance training. After the workout, you might feel a little tired, might feel a little fatigued, but you don't necessarily feel sore. Well, then the next morning you wake up and it's like, oh my gosh, my muscles are screaming at me. They're on fire. That is usually normal, okay? That pain associated with it is called DOMS. Now, if it is extreme, it's absolutely unbearable, that might be room for concern, then you should reach out to a medical professional but anywhere from 24 to 72 hours of soreness is completely normal, especially if you're either just starting out or trying a new workout program for the first time. Anything longer than that, you might be a little concerned, but if, if that soreness is starting to go away after that 72 hours, then usually that's pretty normal. What happens when we resistance train and why do we get that DOMS? Why do we get that muscle soreness? Well, there are a few different theories on why our muscles get sore. Um, but one of the most common theories is that 
the muscles actually break down. They call it micro tears in the muscle. Now this is not room for concern. Okay, this is totally normal. What happens then is that those micro tears that occur, it kind of signals to the rest of the body that, hey, these muscles need to be rebuilt and they need to re be rebuilt stronger, um, you know, so that they can uh, withstand that same level of resistance uh, in the future. So your body kind of signals to different parts of the body. We're not going to get into the intricacies of all of that right now, but then your muscles rebuild over time. That soreness is usually attributed to maybe the micro tears or the signaling mechanism that occurs with that damage to the muscle. So this sounds scary as I mentioned, but that's our body signal to rebuild and rebuild stronger. Soreness is completely normal, extreme soreness that lasts for many, many, many days and does not improve, could be cause for concern, but is very rare and usually only happens if someone does way too much at once, okay? So some ways to overcome that soreness are just to make sure you're eating plenty of protein, make sure that you're drinking plenty of water, make sure that you are getting plenty of sleep, getting plenty of rest in between workouts, and then your soreness should kind of subside after a little while. So if I was first starting out on a resistance training program, I've never done resistance training before. This is the protocol that I would follow. I would first start by doing two full body workouts per week. I would perform one exercise for every major muscle group. So I would do a vertical pushing movement, a vertical pulling movement, some type of squat movement, some type of hip hinge movement. Maybe you've heard of the deadlift exercise that's considered a hip hinge movement. I would do a horizontal push movement, a horizontal pull movement, and some sort of core stability work. So those are all the muscle groups that I would get involved. I would probably do two sets of each exercise. I would do a weight that is slightly challenging for me, but doable for eight to 10 repetitions. And that's kind of what I would aim for. And then from there, I would gradually progress it over time. If my goal was to improve my strength alone, maybe I'm not trying to you know, build up my muscles super big, but maybe I'm training for a strongman competition or a powerlifting meet, I would try to slowly progress the weight or the resistance that I use. If my goal was to build up my muscle mass, my lean muscle mass, maybe I'm competing in a bodybuilding show, or maybe I'm just trying to get that health benefit of inc increasing places where I can store my glucose after, after my meals. Then I would gradually add volume, either by increasing the reps, the weight, and maybe adding a set or two to those exercises before increasing the frequency of my workouts. Then maybe after that, I would experiment with trying different workouts, different workout splits, and maybe more free weight based movements. So that's kind of how I would just do the general progression of that workout or that training program. Now, before we wrap things up here, I think that it's important to address any safety concerns that we might have. There is a huge lesson in the importance of listening to your body, having proper form and when to seek professional guidance with your exercise form. So, Step one to resistance training is making sure that you're doing proper form. So I mentioned some of the general movements that I would do to hit every major muscle group. I also mentioned practicing maybe body weight or light machine work to get started. Um, but how do I know what proper form is? The first step I would take is learn how to brace my core properly. This ensures that my spine is protected. If your spine is protected, usually the rest of your body follows, okay? So ensure that you understand how to brace your core. We're not gonna talk about that in this podcast episode, but there are plenty of great resources out there to help you learn how to do that. Step two, I would search for the exercises based on the movement that I want to accomplish. There are great YouTube videos out there. There are not so great YouTube videos out there, but usually the most popular videos are, are pretty reliable and pretty good resources, especially for someone first starting out. Step three, I would practice the movements either in front of a mirror, prop up my phone and record, do something to ensure that my form matches what I'm seeing or what I'm learning from somebody else. And then as a basic principle, lifting weights should never cause pain. You should feel the stress of your muscles working hard, but anything sharp is not what you want to aim for. This is where that listen to your body comes into play. There's a huge lesson in that. Always listen to your body. In a kind of side note, this might be a little biased, but I think if you're first starting out, 
if you're able to consider hiring a personal trainer either local in your area consider some type of reliable online personal training something like that or reach out to some sort of exercise expert about your form okay a lot of individuals want to see these want to see beginners succeed okay so if you reach out to them with questions about your exercise form more often than not they will be happy to respond and help you out so this can streamline your progress ensure that you're safe and the trainer can also provide guidance on making progressions um, and any adaptations necessary to your training program. Okay, so that's kind of a biased side note, but I think that there is a lot of benefit in a good personal trainer, especially when you're first starting out. A few other basic principles, warm up and cool down. Okay, these are very important. I think the warm up is probably more important for resistance training than the cool down. Cool down is a little bit more important for aerobic exercise, but we'll talk about both here. A simple protocol for a warm-up is called the RAMP protocol. RAMP is an acronym that stands for raise, activate, mobilize, and potentiate. So raise, you want to raise your body's temperature. You want to feel a little bit warm. Okay, this can be accomplished by quicker movements. Maybe you just hop on some sort of cardio piece of equipment for five minutes. Just kind of get, get the heart pumping, get uh, the body warmed up. Then we have activate. So you want to make sure you're activating the muscles that are being worked. So if you know you're going to do a lower body day, you're going to be doing a lot of squat based movements. Maybe start with some simple body weight squats to get those muscles activated. Next, we're going to want to mobilize the joints that we're using. So make sure that you're moving through that full range of motion. You might do some dynamic stretches or some some type of active warm up. And then finally, potentiate. So you want to work your way up to whatever working resistance or working weight that you are hoping to achieve for that workout. If I am doing 100 pounds of bench press as my working weight in the sets that I do, I will want to do some warm up sets building up to that. So maybe first set I just do 50 pounds, maybe the next set I do 75 pounds, but eventually I will work my way up to that 100 pounds that I'm working towards. And that's how you potentiate your way up to your working sets. And then lastly, the cool down. So um, just as a general rule, um, any type of activity that really elevates your heart rate or gets you working really hard, you might want to take a few minutes just to calm down, relax before getting into the car or sitting down after a while. You just don't want to make yourself pass out or anything because your blood is pumping throughout your body a lot when you exercise and you don't want it to all kind of pool. So the cool down kind of allows your body to relax and recover and ensure that that pooling of blood in your lower extremities doesn't occur. So you can do simple things like stretching. This can help you improve your flexibility after your workout. You can just do some light, easy walking around. Basically, you just don't want to sit for a very long period of time. You want to have some sort of buffer in between the end of your workout and then leaving the gym or going on to your next task. All right, that is all I have in terms of starting resistance training, starting your resistance training routine. I hope that you found it beneficial. Today we talked about some of those common barriers that individuals might face when they are first considering resistance training. We talked about kind of simple protocols and principles to follow in order to start resistance training. And uh, I hope that it was beneficial. Uh, again, this is the Fitness Blueprint Podcast. My name is Jackson Adamwitz. Thank you for joining me. Uh, stick around for future episodes about starting your fitness journey and about fitness topics that a lot of people have questions about. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that about the podcast, feel free to reach out to us, leave comments, check out our social media, and make sure that you subscribe to the podcast. Give us a rating. Give us feedback. Uh, we like to we like to make improvements, so let me know what we can do. And uh, yeah, have a great day today. Thank you for joining me. I will see you for our next episode of the Fitness Blueprint Podcast. Peace.